Hey, thanks for coming. I know I'm competing with Tomasz talking about metals, which is a super fancy talk right now happening in the Functor uh, hall, but so I'm even more grateful for you coming here. Uh, and my name is Wojtek. I work at Sony Electronics and I would like to tell you a little bit about frontend and how to survive the encounter with it. And before we begin, I would like to tell you why I'm doing this particular talk. I'm doing it because I had a very rough experience with front-end development. Uh, it cost me a lot of pain, and uh, I had this rough experience because I failed to realize in time that back-end and front-end developer uh, development are very different. Uh, and when I asked my friend for an opinion, this is how he sees it, you can probably see that he's a front-end guy. For, for me, the case is a little bit different. For me, front-end is a bloody war. Uh, very, very tough experience. So let me elaborate a little bit on why I think so. So the first thing is that when you're doing front-end, you do uh, stuff that interacts with humans. You no longer interact with computers as you do on the back-end side, but now you have to create something that takes into consideration human psychology, emotions, how we uh, perceive stuff, how aesthetics and, and stuff like that. The other thing is that front-end is built on top of JavaScript, and JavaScript is a very wild uh, environment. And whatever you do on the front-end side, it will sooner or later, you will sooner or later hit JavaScript. The third thing is that front-end is very complex thing. Like there is a lot of different stuff that you need to consider when you want to create a web page. Uh, and you can remove some of those pieces, but sooner or later you'll have to know most of that. Uh, but we are professionals and you just have to do what you have to do and get your hands dirty. And this is why I'm doing this particular talk. So I want to share the knowledge that uh, I would like to have a few years ago when I had my first encounter with it. And this talk is too short to teach you anything, like any details of any uh, technology, so I'm not gonna explain anything in details. Instead, I will tell you how to survive, so what, um, how to live this encounter with the same mind. And this means that, as I told you, I'm not going to show you anything in detail, but I will tell you what to expect and what you probably need to know sooner or later if you want to do front-end development. Okay, so I sh probably should stop introduc introduction at this point, but a few more slides. So why me doing this talk? Uh, and this is important because I identify as a backend developer. This is what I do, this is what I'm good at. Um, and my career somehow reflect that. So I started not that uh, long time ago as a Java Enterprise Edition developer. So if you have ever seen Java Enterprise Edition, Java EE applications that you know that it's almost pure uh, backend stuff, a lot of database, uh, and a lot of business logic. Then after two years, I learned Scala in the meantime and uh, went to the research and development position. When I did a lot of Spark, microservices, APIs, but mostly Spark. Um, then next two years, and I switched to another position when I were were build, we, were, we were building a data lake platform for a bank. Uh, so it was uh, a lot of Hadoop, Spark, services, same stuff. 
And now I'm working at the Sony Electronics. I work in the information security department when we, where we have a small team uh, integrating stuff together for the information security purposes. So as you can see, these positions have nothing to do with front-end development yet. At my first position, uh, I had a lot uh, of opportunities to touch front-end. It was uh, technologies like Java server faces, server pages, and if there was a bug fix or some small change request, you just had to do this. It was not your main area of proficiency, but I had to do this. Then, in the uh, research and development, uh, we were we had pretty sophisticated software infrastructure for A-B testing. So you just have different <coughs> algorithms and you assign these algorithms to different users to see how they perform. Uh, and so uh, this infrastructure needed a front-end application. So we needed something that uh, more business-oriented people could use to configure the, the A-B testing. So for example, how uh, many users gi gets given algorithm. At the same time, I had my two first startup ideas, uh, and I wanted to validate those, build something, see if it works, if it uh, fits the purpose, if there is a need for it, and I had to build some kind of front end. Then in the data lake, you can think of it like, why does, does it need front end at all? It's like pure data, right? But then we needed something that can be shown to other parts of the bank, that can be sold uh, to other teams. And we had to uh, do that, and I had to touch the front end again. And now I, we're, my team is doing a lot of uh, integrations, a lot of automations. But at the same time, this product needs UI, some sort of uh, user interface. And we have that. So now I'm lucky enough that I have at least two real front-end developers that's, uh, that do this. But when there is a small stuff, I don't want to bother them. And I still uh, do this on my own. Uh, so there are two options here. Either uh, I'm cursed and someone above really want me to suffer or front-end development is inevitable. Like sooner or later, you will have to touch it one way or another. And if the second option is true, then you can make some use of this presentation. OK. So when you're doing, uh, when you plan to do front-end development, you first need to select a language uh, to write your page with. And there are a couple of options. There's like, I don't know, 10 or 11 of them here. And the first uh, two, the most important ones, are JavaScript and TypeScript. Um, so they're at least an order of magnitude more popular than anything else on the list. Uh, but at the same time, they're not functional. And this is a criteria for me, the must have for a language to use. Um, Someone say that f JavaScript is a functional language, and this is an open debate. For me, it's not, and I have a very simple test if the language is functional or not. You take an if, and if, if an if does not return a value, it's not a functional language. If an if is a statement, then it's not a functional language. It must be an expression. Uh, then there is a bunch of other languages that all transpile to JavaScript. Uh, and they are all functional. And there is Scala.js, uh, which is not, strictly speaking, more popular than any of the previous uh, ones. But Scala is probably the most popular uh, base language. So of all of those, are based on some other language, backend language, and Scala is the most popular among those base languages. So you have a lot of ecosystem and a lot of libraries, a lot of know-how. Uh, so in that sense, uh, this one is most popular. And as I said, uh, all of that are functional. Uh, but beside that, you also have Kotlin, which is, has enough uh, language features to be used as a functional language, yet it's not a default paradigm there, so it's kind of uh, functional. Okay, 
And there is one position on this list. So if you uh, hide in a cave for the last few years, and before that you have heard about something called CoffeeScript, which was popular a few years ago, now it's completely dead, no one is using it, as far as I know at least. So you can forget about it. Mm. OK, and we will talk in details about these six languages that I find more interesting. So the first one is TypeScript. It was created by Microsoft. And the main advantage of TypeScript is that, is that it became the default for almost any new front-end development. Uh, from what I know, it has uh, beaten the raw JavaScript. And, but, and you can think of it as a JavaScript with types. Uh, TypeScript has a very powerful type system that allows you to do a lot of different stuff. But at the same time, uh, it's very easy to lie in this, uh, in this language. The type system itself is different from what you know from Scala because it's based on the structural types. And structural typing relies on the structure. Uh, so if two types have exactly the same fields of the same types, then they are treated by the compiler as the same. Uh, which is not the case in Scala. If you have two case classes, they have exactly the same fields, then, but they are still two different types. So this is the main difference. Um, so functional programming in TypeScript is possible. W uh, I will talk about this later on. Uh, but it's not idiomatic, it's not the default. Uh, so it's quite hard. And there is one point that will show up multiple times during this presentation, is that even if we take TypeScript, which is the most popular uh, front-end language uh, other than JavaScript, and we take the most popular JavaScript library, which is React, let's say so, let's assume so, and you combine those two together, it still doesn't work. Like the, when you want to use JavaScript library with a, language other than JavaScript, you have to use some kind of bindings. So for TypeScript, these are just the types for functions. And with React, we had like w we had to wait at least a week or two weeks before they aligned. So even though the people prepared the types, the types didn't match the actual implementation and the stuff broke. Um, OK. The next one on the list is Reason. Unfortunately, I didn't have a chance to try it, but it was created by Microsoft, and it's based on OCaml. Uh, Facebook? Ah, sorry, sorry. Yeah, by Facebook, and uh, yeah, it's based on OCaml, uh, uh, and that's it. Another one is Elm, and I think Elm is the most popular among the functional ones in a strict sense. Uh, a lot of people seems to like Elm. It was created by Ivan. It is very opinionated, so uh, the language tries to solve problems for you, so you don't have to choose. Uh, it has, for example, built-in state management model, so if you have some experience with uh, state management, then it is built in in Elm. It is strongly separated from JavaScript, which is good, so you have to work hard to use JavaScript libraries and language encourages you to use native Elm libraries. And it's based on Haskell, just uh, it's reduced because it has uh, some features removed like type classes. So it's simpler. Um, and it has pretty good tooling, I have to say. This was pretty impressive. Uh, alternative to Elm, also built on Haskell, is uh, PureScript. Uh, so it's uh, closer to, to Haskell, but at the same time, it's not as popular as Elm, and it, it has to just to uh, compete with it. Another alternative I didn't have a chance to use is Fable. Fable was built on top of F-sharp, so if you're a, a C-sharp guy or an F-sharp F -sharp guy, then uh, you can try to use it. I know it's pretty popular, but that's all I know. And we have our beloved Scala.js. Who has tried to use Scala.js here? Do you like it? Yeah. OK, uh, so uh, I really like Scala.js for one particular reason, is that I can use I, all my knowledge, all my know-how, and at least half of my libraries there. 
Uh, so I can leverage a lot of stuff I already know. I don't have to new uh, to learn new stuff. Uh, the problem is that it's for me. My experience is that it's pretty hard to convince uh, like real front-end developers and management to use it for some reason. Then don't think it's that easy or approachable. But for me, it's really really good. Mm. So if TypeScript is so popular. Then and it's type safe because you have a pretty good type system there. Why would you not want to use it? And there is one main reason for me. It's too easy to lie in TypeScript. So uh, there, it's enough for you to say that um, you hope that it will be your required type, and TypeScript will uh, move move on. And it's similar, you can think that it's similar to as instance of in Scala. The main difference is that casting in Java or Scala will break at the point of casting. And it's okay, it fails early. In TypeScript, this, is, this has no effect in runtime, so it will break on the first usage of, uh, let's say, undefined field. So we can pass an object as a node, it can be a string. You pass it as a node, five layers below, you try to access a field, and this field doesn't exist. And only then you learn that your casting was wrong. So this is the main problem I have with, uh, with TypeScript. Mm. And there is the second part that uh, is connected to JavaScript, and it's TypeScript is just JavaScript with types, so they don't want to implement any additional features. Uh, in the language itself, they want to be as compatible as possible. But other than that, yes, TypeScript is a good language. If you don't have uh, another choice, then it's not that bad. Okay, so functional programming in TypeScript, as I said, it is possible. Uh, there, are, there is a couple of libraries, and we are talking about front-end world, so couple means like at least a few tens or da like hundreds of libraries uh, to do the same stuff. But I listed some here, there is a lot more, so you can just Google and find stuff to do functional programming there. And when we talk about language, you may think about WebAssembly. So how does it compare to what we listed before? And uh, WebAssembly is not really meant for general purpose web application, from what I know. Uh, it's more like if you want to create a game or something very interactive or uh, performance critical, like more critical, uh, then WebAssembly is, uh, is a good choice, but it's target for more native languages, like something that compiles to native code, to uh, assembly, so Rust, Go, Scala Native, stuff like that. Mm. Okay, so you you need to choose a language, now you need to choose a framework. So a set of libraries or other tools that you will use to create your application. And you have uh, a lot of choice here, but the main three uh, technologies to be used are the three, React, Angular, and Vue. You probably at least have heard the name React, right? Who has heard React? Everyone, yes, this is what I expected. Uh, and uh, quick comparison, uh, I'm not an expert here, but it's better than nothing. So for me, React is like do it yourself. It does one thing and does it pretty well. Uh, it only renders HTML. But at the same time, you need the knowledge of the ecosystem to compose other libraries to use with React, which makes a learning curve more steep. Then there's Angular, which is a proper framework, and it will try to give you all the abstractions, all the stuff that you need to build a, an application, which makes it easier to start using, but at the same time, it has all the drawbacks of frameworks. And a friend of mine called it Java EE for front-end, so I think it's a pretty good approximation. And there is Vue, and this one I didn't have a chance to use, but uh, it's the youngest of the three. It tries to merge the best parts of the previous two, and it tries to be super accessible to the new users, but it costs a lot of magic being introduced. So 
you have to make some trade-offs. Um, what as I told you, you should, uh, or maybe not. <laughs> uh, anyway, you w if you want to use these libraries uh, from Scala JS application, you need some kind of API, uh, some something written in Scala that will expose a JavaScript library to you. And you have two ways: you can either use a machine-generated binding that I will show later on, or you want something that was written by actual human. And uh, there are two such libraries, Scala.js React and Slinky. Uh, I couldn't find anything actively maintained uh, for Angular or Vue, so uh, we don't have much choice here. Uh, and the difference between Scala.js and Slinky is that Scala.js is older and it's written in plain Scala, where Slinky is built on top of macros to give you the experience closer to native React experience. It's newer uh, and still, like, get being developed. Um, but as I already told you, bindings to JavaScript libraries will fail you at some point. So you should try to avoid using those. If you really want to use those, you can, there is a very nice project called Scalably Typed. So whenever you want to use a JavaScript library, not React or Angular or something, but any JavaScript library, this project tries to generate Scala.js interfaces from the TypeScript uh, types. And it's actively maintained, really nice. Uh, but alternative to React, Angular, and Vue are uh, libraries written from scratch in Scala, not using any kind of JavaScript other than the runtime. Uh, and this is binding Scala, Outwatch, and Laminar. Uh, binding Scala has the advantage of not using virtual DOM, so it operates directly of the uh, model being rendered by the browser, and it relies heavily on macros. The opposite of this is Outwatch, which uses virtual DOM and is written in uh, plain Scala, and something in the middle is Laminar. The, this is the option I like the most, so you uh, still operate on the real DOM, uh, so it's pretty fast, and but you don't have to use macros uh, because macros are quite unpredictable and opaque. Um, okay, maybe maybe you want something different, and there are a few options here as well. So you can try to use Udash. Uh, from what I know, it's a framework that will try to give you uh, some integrated experience uh, with. Uh, front-end and communication with the back-end. I didn't have a chance to use it. There is Corolev, which sounds like a really nice project. Uh, I really want to try that. And Corolev renders the whole page on the back-end side and just sends the divs to the front-end. So it's not a typical single-page application with a fat client. It's uh, the client itself is very thin. Uh, and there is Play, so maybe you don't need a single page application. Maybe you can send HTML just with each request to the backend. It was how we did web pages for a pretty long time in PHP and stuff like that, so maybe it still works. There's nothing particularly wrong with it. Um, but there is a big chance you will end up using React. And when you use React, you need at least a something to manage state of your application. So for example, just for you to understand what is state management, when you make a, a request to the backend to fetch some data, you want to start showing the spinner. When you get the response, you want to hide the spinner and uh, show the data. And if the request failed, you want to show an error with some, probably some completely different place on an application. And you need to somehow store this information. So state management is a phrase for this kind of pr uh, problem to be solved. The most popular approach is Redux, but I have a huge PTSD uh, for using React Re Redux, if you say it, I will probably run in fear. Uh, alternative to that is Diode, which is a little bit similar, but written in uh, native Scala, which much better API and less boilerplate. And uh, I also have React Refetch here because it's the simplest approach I have seen to state management. 
it's really nice for the, the most simple stuff. And there is a lot of stuff alternative to that, like Mobix, Redux Observable, Sagas, and stuff like that. Another note about React. If you really uh, need to use it, some recent version of React introduced uh, stuff called React Hooks. And this is really neat. Uh, so if you're using React, you should learn that because it simplifies uh, code a lot, gets away a lot of troubles out of your head. OK, so you have built your application in some way or another. Now you need to make it pretty. And if I was to create the UI, it would look more or less like that. So I may be biologically incapable of creating pretty stuff, but a lot of backend developers have this property. Uh, but there are a few tricks you can use uh, to make it better. Uh, but before we do that, I need to tell you one thing, and it's that almost no one writes CSS anymore. Uh, like at all CSS. In the big applications, you will use some kind of uh, CSS uh, preprocessor, so something that will take a format and generate CSS out of it. So it's like, uh, like transpilation to JavaScript. And there are three main examples of that. It's less SAS and stylus. I don't really know the difference, and I don't really care about the differences between those. Uh, the important part that all of that tries to give you these features, so stuff you know from real programming languages, and like variables, functions, in general means of abstraction. And here is the example. So I think it's SAS, but it really doesn't matter. You have a function called transform, and it sets three CSS properties with the given value. You say that the box class should include these properties, you run it through the uh, compiler or preprocessor, and you get a CSS out. It's that simple. And the second thing I want to tell you about styling stuff is there are things called UI toolkits, UI libraries, and basically these libraries give you an API in form of CSS classes, and you can use those classes to make uh, stuff look pretty uh, neat, uh, without writing any form of uh, CSS. I have a few examples here. So there is a semantic UI, which is my favorite. I think it looks the best. There is mini CSS, Bootstrap, Foundation, other stuff like Metro, Material, and so all of those will give you nice looking UI, not a cus custom UI. You probably want to, like for a your product, the main product of your company, then you don't want to use those without additional styling. But if you're building something for your own, it will just make stuff quite nice. And one addition, when you try to deal with styling, you will sooner or later hear the responsive web design uh, phrase. And just to tell you what it is, it's just about adjusting layout of the screen to the screen size. Uh, simple as that. Okay, so we talked about language, framework, styling. Now we need to somehow communicate front-end with the back-end. So the back-end will have some data, front-end needs to display it, manipulate it, whatever. And the first thing you will probably think of is um, good old REST based on HTTP. And it's good. I really like it. The problem with REST is that it's quite inefficient. So if you want to have your data normalized and not duplicate that, and you have some connections between resources, then you need to have multiple requests uh, going to the backend just to fetch those. Because in one JSON you will have IDs, then you get the IDs you have to put to another endpoint to, to get this additional data, which is not efficient and uh, makes bad user experience. Other than that, it's pretty good. Alternative to that, and alternative that you really should at least know a bit, is GraphQL. GraphQL was uh, created by Facebook quite uh, some time ago. And you can think of it as SQL for the front end. So it's a technology that allows you to write queries on the front end side. 
and then backend will give you what you asked for. So you can ask for particular tables in terms of SQL, particular columns, and the backend will compose all this data together and give you with a single request. And it has a lot of other nice features. Um, so it's a really big topic. I can just give you some understanding of how it works. So the server exposes a schema, so all the operation and types define, defined on the backend. And then in the client code, you just write a queries that tells what stuff you want in a GraphQL. And then out of those queries, you can generate uh, classes, uh, types, and so on in TypeScript, uh, Scala.js, or whatever. So it's, it's a nice feature. Uh, but you can do this without it if you want. And if you, this sounds to you as SQL injection, yes. It's very similar idea. Mm. Okay, so in Sangria, we have two alternatives uh, for dealing with, uh, with GraphQL. Uh, in Scala, we have Sangria, which was uh, the original library, the only one for a long time. Unfortunately, the, its creator, Oleg Ilienko, passed away last year, but people picked up his work and this project is still alive. And there is a new alternative called Caliban, released like maybe a week or two ago. And it's more uh, in the spirit of functional programming, if you like that. Mm. And one important thing you need to know about GraphQL is that you may not need to write any backend at all. Because there are tools that will expose your database directly to the frontend as a GraphQL server and it may not be the best solution for all of the cases because it sounds pretty dangerous but i have used postgrafile and hasura and this works pretty well so uh, if you have little business logic uh, on the back end and you want to just expose the data there is no point in writing yet another crud a service REST, database access, and stuff like that. There's no reason you can expose this directly. And with Hasura, for example, you can merge the exposed data from database with an API you develop in the service running uh, next to it, and expose it as a single schema, single set of operations. Mm. Alternative is RPC. And in terms of RPC, I would like to mention that there is something called gRPC Web but it doesn't work. <laughs> uh, and what I mean by that uh, is that uh, because uh, browsers does not expose enough of HTTP2 internals to the JavaScript, it, uh, JavaScript cannot consume uh, gRPC directly. You have to run additional proxy uh, between your frontend and your gRPC uh, server. So if you want to do that, then it works, but without that, it does not. Mm. Okay, there is alternative, yet another one, and I call it shared REST. Uh, so if your front-end and back-end are written in the same language, in this case Scala, you can try to share your endpoint definitions bef between front-end and the back-end, which removes quite a lot of boilerplate. And there are three libraries uh, to do that in Scala. I'm still quite involved in endpoints. It was created by Julien Lichouafoua. Uh, and there is alternative, which is Tapir, uh, created by Software Mill and typed API, which is different in a way that it relies on types, tries to do a lot of type level in a similar way to Haskell Servant, if you know that. Mm. Okay, and we talk about communication, but sometimes you need streams of data instead of just request response. And you have two uh, options to uh, get that, WebSockets and server sent events. Uh, WebSockets are built on top of uh, raw TCP. Uh, it has nothing to do with uh, HTTP. And the communication there is bidirectional and also binary. Um, 
So it's pretty low level mechanism. Uh, server sent events is built on top of, on top of HTTP. It was uh, specified uh, as a part of HTML5. It has native browser support, uh, API to consume those. Uh, it's unidirectional, so you can just send stuff. You cannot receive anything back in the same channel. And it's based on the text uh, format. And there are some limitations in the browser, but it's not that important. Important part is, in my experience, server sent events are enough for most of the use cases. So you don't really need WebSockets until you really need uh, them. Uh, so SSE is my first choice nowadays. Okay, so now I want to talk a little bit about tooling because you need quite a lot of that in front end. Um, and the first thing you will need is some dependency manager. So the choice currently is between NPM and YARN. Um, uh, but before we go there, I have to say that NPM is based on the source dependencies. So what you get from the internet is uh, just JavaScript. Uh, and this, in, when you join this with the number of libraries in uh, JavaScript ecosystem, uh, it gets pretty heavy. Okay, and oh, this didn't render. So I could go like that for a few another rounds, but let's go into details. And uh, you you will find the comparison in slides. But the main idea here is that there was npm. It was slow and it didn't have a log files. Then Facebook created Yarn to be faster and have and had log files. Then npm improved and implemented all of that stuff. And now they are more or less similar. There are no big differences. So you can still use both. Um, yeah. Uh, now is the more tricky part, which is bundling. So when you create an application, you write your, all of your Scala.js or Elm or TypeScript code, you want to ship it. You want to build a package that will be uh, sent to the browser and uh, yeah by your, by your HTTP server and to do that you need something called a bundler um, that will start with scanning all your uh, roots source roots for imports uh, then it will transform what uh, make a list of files and transform the files uh, according to the rules you specify. So for example, it can transpile TypeScript to JavaScript, it can uh, pre-process uh, SAS files, it can optimize JavaScript, like tree shaking, minimization, and stuff like that. So it will apply all those transformation. It will join them together. Mm, sorry for the rendering. Uh, join them together and produce a bundle. And the bundle can look like that, so you have a single CSS file, single JavaScript file with your code and another one with your dependencies, because they can change uh, in differently, and a, a, a folder with the assets like images and so on. Mm. And in native front-end ecosystem, you have two alternatives right now, I think more, but these are the two main ones. Webpack and Rollup. Uh, I haven't been using Rollup much, but Webpack seems to be very popular uh, and basically a standard. Uh, in Scala.js, you have two alternatives to solve this problem. You have SBT Web and uh, Scala.js Bundler. So uh, SBT Web is a real alternative. It tries to do all the bundling stuff inside SBT. So just by invoking uh, TypeScript compiler, SAS preprocessor, and stuff like that. Um, and it has a bunch of plugins for all of that transformations. The second solution is uh, Scala.js Bundler, and this is just an SBT wrapper around Webpack and NPM. Um, yeah, and you, so you just declare your dependencies inside the SBT, SBT file. You have your Webpack configuration, and you can run Webpack from SBT. Okay, 
So it's almost everything you need to know. There are just a few last things. Um, the first one is Node. So if you really like your front-end development, for some reason, I don't judge, uh, you can create back-end applications with the same tools, same JavaScript libraries with TypeScript or whatever. And it's not that bad as it sounds. I have created at least one service with Scala.js and Node just because it has much lower memory footprint and startup time. Uh, I don't think it went to production, but it's not that bad idea. Then, uh, if you want to make a standalone application with your web page, then you can use Electron. It will consume all your RAM and CPU probably, but you have your standalone application. A lot of stuff is being built this way uh, nowadays, so there is it. Uh, you need something to write your, uh, your code with, and the two main alternatives are Visual Studio Code and IntelliJ, and I'm the IntelliJ guy. So if you get the ultimate edition, then it's, it works pretty well with all sorts of front-end uh, specific stuff. So I really recommend that. Uh, there is also a project called Bootzooka, created by Software Meal, uh, which is a template for a project with uh, JavaScript and something. And I just love everything created by Software Meal, so I had to link it. Um, OK. So, few takeaways for you. First thing is that bindings doesn't work. Uh, and so, you should be really careful when you use JavaScript. JavaScript libraries don't work, they will break sooner or later, so you shouldn't be using that. Uh, then, if you don't have a better alternative. You have React and Angular. React is do-it-yourself. Angular is a framework. But there is a bunch of Scala.js libraries that can do the same thing. So you should maybe look into those before you look into React. But obviously, React has like two or three orders of magnitude more users. So there, it, it may be a good reason to use React instead. Um, if you're like me and you can't create stuff that looks nice, then you should use one of those uh, UI toolkits, like Semantic UI, that will give you nice styling out of the box. GraphQL is a thing, so front-end developers really love it. It's not very convenient on the back-end side, but they still don't care. <laughs> And, and love it, and maybe they will force it on you. So you can either try to write it, or you can maybe expose it from database. Uh, yeah. Some kind of dependency manager for JavaScript and some kind of bundler are inevitable. You will need those. So it might be good to just take a look and learn NPM and Webpack, because this, those are the most popular ones. OK, so this is all I prepared for you. My name was Wojtek. Uh, you can find me on Twitter. You can find the slides under this link. And if you go there, there is also a feedback button if you want to leave me a comment. Uh, so I can take questions now. Hi, uh, thank you for your presentation. Uh, I agree with you on the bindings are broken. <laughs> uh, do you know a, any uh, library that can add some uh, runtime check uh, for bindings uh, that you can put on the development mode, and remove them on production mode? I think it could be interesting, but don't find some, so. I haven't seen anything like that, but yeah, indeed it could be, could be a good solution. Uh, thank you for the talk. I was wondering. Um, I, I personally use a lot of Thrift for for and like RPC, uh, mm -hmm. server to server, whatever. Uh, and I'm, I'm when I do front end, I always wish there was something as easy to use. H have you looked into this or Thrift? Thrift, yeah. Uh, I haven't looked, but my experience is that 
if something exists, there is a front-end version of it. So there is probably something. It's probably of little quality and unman unmaintained, but uh, there must be something. I will look harder. <laughs> Do you feel prepared for the encounter with the front end? A little bit more, I hope. Okay. If no more, then thank you.